Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our event honoring Wrongful Conviction Day. My name is Dennis Baker, and I'm the director of the criminal justice programs here at Guelph. I'm here tonight as the MC, but you won't be hearing much from me tonight, uh, to my students' great relief, I'm sure. Uh, but I'm going to try and keep things organized so we use this new form effectively. I hope you'll bear with us as we will no doubt have a few technical bumps this evening. Uh, this is CJPP's first major event in this very different academic year. So the plan for the evening is to have an introduction from Dean Byron Sheldrick, and then Professor Yule will introduce our guest, Rob Baltovich, and ask some opening questions for about 30 minutes before you'll have the opportunity to ask yours. Uh, that's assuming I could figure out how Zoom works. We'll be taking questions via the chat function, so feel free to type yours as the evening progresses. They will come to me and then we'll have readers uh, read them out. Uh, that's how we're gonna proceed, at least at first. Uh, we're gonna ask you to keep your camera off and we recommend you use, use speaker view uh, for the best experience. So without any further ado, uh, Dean Sheldrick, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Dennis, and welcome, everyone. It's, it's really my great pleasure. As Dennis said, I'm, the, I'm actually the acting dean for the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences, and it's really a great pleasure to, to be here tonight and welcome you all to Wrongful Conviction Day. The college has been celebrating or, or actually, well, honoring Wrongful Conviction Day for some time now, and really it's a wonderful opportunity to highlight kind of some of the central themes of our criminal justice and public policy program and some of the, the focus on, on justice issues. So it's really a great pleasure to be here and, and to welcome you all to this very important event, which highlights a, a central issue of our justice system. Before we go on and really start things, though, I also want to acknowledge that the University of Guelph resides on the uh, ter traditional ter treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and, and this, this territory has been historically governed by the Dish with One Spoon Covenant. And while we might all be spread out across uh, the province or even the country, uh, it's important as we gather to recognize and think about the traditional lands and territories and the indigenous peoples that have historically uh, and continue to reside on those, on those lands. And uh, the importance of us trying to ensure that reconciliation is at the forefront of everything we do. And so welcome once more. And with that, I'll turn it over, I think back to Dennis, who's going to uh, commence the proceedings of the evening. Welcome everyone. Thanks, Byron. Uh, so very quickly, I will turn it over to Professor Ewell to introduce our honoree and exoneree. All right, good evening, everyone. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Mr. Robert Baltovich as our guest this evening. As many of you likely know, Mr. Voltovich was wrongly convicted in the 1990 murder of his girlfriend Elizabeth or Liz Bain. He spent eight years in prison and then has spent another decade fighting to prove his innocence. Mr. Voltovich was deemed not guilty by the courts in 2008. And given that our goal tonight is to help bring attention to the injustices faced by the wrongly convicted, we're incredibly fortunate to have Rob joining us. Thank you so much for being here. I'm not going to say any more by way of introduction right now, um, as I'd like Mr. Boltovich to be able to have an opportunity to tell his own story in his own words. So without any further ado, if you can sort of tell us in your own words what happened in, in 1990, what led to your wrongful conviction? Okay, well, first of all, uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, well, in 1990, I was actually a, a graduate of the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. Uh, I graduated on June 8th, 1990. And uh, 11 days later, my girlfriend at the time, uh, Elizabeth Bain, uh, went missing. She left her house sometime in the late afternoon, um, early evening of June 19th, 1990. And um, she never came back. Um, Liz and I actually met in the fall of 1987. We started dating around June of uh, 1989. So we'd actually been in a relationship for about a year. And when she went missing, um, 
in the beginning, we didn't really know what to think. Um, she had left some somewhat cryptic uh, diary entries suggesting that she might have just wanted to run away or that she might have wanted to harm herself. But, you know, we found her car about two and a half days after she went missing. Uh, the car was examined. Uh, there was blood found in the back of her car, which, as it turns out, uh, belonged to her. Uh, and from that point on, it became uh, an investigation of foul play with the suspicion that she'd been murdered. And I was actually invited to speak to the police several times uh, during the period when she was uh, first reported missing, which was the Wednesday morning, June 20th, 1990. And it was actually on uh, June 24th, which was a Sunday that uh, I was asked to attend for an interview uh, by the Toronto Police Homicide Squad. And uh, about halfway through the interview, that's when they proceeded to tell me that they were absolutely convinced that I had murdered her and that um, it would probably be easier for me if I just confessed, which of course I couldn't do because I didn't know what had happened to her. And, um, you know, I had no idea where she might have been or even if she was still alive. But um, five months to the day after Liz went missing, I was arrested and I was charged with first degree murder. Um, I spent a year in custody uh, before I was granted bail. Uh, in large part because after a preliminary hearing, I was um, committed to trial on second degree murder, which in Canada is considered to be a, a, a less serious offense. It's still a very serious offense, but certainly less serious in first degree. And um, uh, my trial began in January of 1992. And on uh, March 31st, uh, you know, much to my uh, disappointment, I was uh, convicted of that crime. And um, it was really um, in 1999 when my fortunes really changed. That's when I, I first um, contacted the then Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted. Now, of course, Innocence Canada. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get two very good lawyers to represent me, James Lockyer and uh, Joanne McLean. Uh, they were able to get me bail uh, a year later in 2000, pending the hearing of my appeal. Um, I was out and I guess you could say I got back to a, a fairly normal life with the hope that eventually my uh, appeal would succeed. Um, it took a long time. Uh, the appeal began in uh, September of 2004. Uh, in December of 2004, I was granted a new trial. My conviction was quashed. Um, another four years of uh, endless judicial red tape and uh, lots of different hearings and a couple of false starts, uh, and then it all ended on April 22nd, uh, 2008, when uh, the Crown Attorney walked into court and asked the judge to instruct the jury to acquit me, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, I know that that is uh, a profoundly inadequate summary uh, because it's been an incredibly complex case with a lot of twists and turns. Um, but I think just for the sake of a summary and an introduction, that would probably suffice because otherwise I think I could probably be here for a couple of hours. So. No, it's, that's a perfect overview. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, just to build a little bit more, I guess, on the, the wrongful conviction, what would you identify as the single most important contributor? Or, or well, class? well, as it happened, in, in my case, uh, the single greatest contributor is probably... Uh, the single greatest contributor in any wrongful conviction, which is erroneous eyewitness or, you know, identification evidence. In my case, no eyewitnesses, but two witnesses in particular who believed that they had seen me at crucial times, uh, one on the night that Liz went missing, uh, another several days after she went missing, uh, because, of course, there was a lag between the time Liz went missing and when her car was found. I was actually arrested as a result of a man who claimed to be able to identify me as having been driving Liz's car roughly three days after she went missing. So I think if you look at wrongful convictions as a whole, uh, obviously there are a lot of different uh, causes. And, and you know, in many cases, there are multiple causes within individual cases. But for me, and, and certainly I know from reading the literature, uh, it was definitely uh, erroneous eyewitness identification. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, as you've said, eyewitness misidentification is one of the leading causes of wrongful conviction. Um, very difficult to to convince a court and a jury when you've got somebody pointing the finger at saying, I, I saw this person and I know it was him, to convince them otherwise. Yeah, and, and I know just looking at the literature, uh, it's a really difficult um, problem in particular because juries historically have credited honest and sincere witnesses with a lot more accuracy than they deserve. Um, I think the good news is that I think uh, since my trial in 1992, we know a lot more about the limits of uh, identification evidence and the various ways that you can, you know, try to minimize the likelihood that those types of mistakes will happen. But as someone who sat in court and listened to two people basically say, that's the guy I saw, um, I can tell you that it is, as the literature says, deceptively credible. Um, yeah but it can be devastating, uh, devastatingly effective, even in a case where you're dealing with someone who is factually innocent. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then can you tell us a little bit about your legal representation at the first trial? So, you know, you're in the court and you've got these eyewitnesses saying that with confidence that they think you're the person. How would you describe your legal representation? Looking back, as well as at the time, did you feel that um, your, your defense team was working in your best interest? Were they, you know, what, what would, what do you have to say about them? Well, I mean, I, I guess one of the things that, that handicapped me, um, from the outset is that, um, I kind of sensed early on that I was going to need a lawyer just to kind of navigate my way through the investigation because the police, you know, essentially came right out and said to me, we know you did it. Right. So I actually consulted with the lawyer after my initial interrogation by the police. And of course, he said, you know, don't talk to the police anymore. Right. Which I tried to abide by uh, to the best of my ability. So, you know, I'd never been in trouble with the law before. I didn't really know, like, if I could afford a lawyer. I didn't know how legal aid operated. So I was somewhat in the dark. I mean, somewhat paradoxically, I, I think if I'd been in trouble with the law before, I might have had a little bit more insight into who I needed to represent me mm -hmm. on such a very serious, serious charge. In any event, on the day I was arrested, I effectively had a lawyer. Uh, and I was so shocked that um, I was arrested. That I was just glad to have anyone representing me. Um, I wasn't really in a position to do a lot of due diligence. Um, it wasn't really until later on that I realized that the people that were representing me, regardless of the fact that they were earnest, um, were not very experienced. Uh, they were former Crown attorneys. Uh, they had never defended a murder case before. Um, they were quite young. Um, and it wasn't really until the trial that I realized that through no fault of my lawyers, or at least largely not due to to, to them, uh, they were pretty much outmatched. Um, okay. You know, I mean, I still remember actually not long after I was arrested, somebody approached me when I was in custody and, and he asked me who my lawyers were. And when I told him, he kind of gave me this very strange look and he said, you know what? He said, um, you got to get new lawyers. He said, because you're facing a very serious charge and I don't think you really truly understand what you're up against here. Like you got to get, like he gave me a list of five of them. Ironically, one of the lawyers he gave me on that list was James Locke here. Yeah. Um, but I guess the other problem I had is that I knew I was innocent. So for me being somewhat naive, I mean, I was just shocked to have even been charged and then committed to trial. And I guess in the back of my mind, I thought everything was going to be fine and it wasn't until it was too late that I realized that, you know, maybe, you know, I needed to have better representation. Uh, I wouldn't say they didn't work hard, uh, but it wasn't really until years later that I realized that I didn't have the representation I really needed. Mm -hmm. um, maybe for no greater reason than the fact that they were just very, very inexperienced and we were up against a very experienced and very capable prosecutor. 
So one of the sad features of this case, and, and obviously there are many, is that to this day, we don't know what happened. Um, so it's been suggested that, that Paul Bernardo might be the real culprit in this case. So my question to you, I guess, is who raised this as a possibility? And in your view, is there much merit to the speculation? Well, at the time that Liz went missing, um, it, it was actually somewhat odd that the police didn't think there was a possibility that she had been uh, the victim of the Scarborough rapist. Now, to go back to 1990, particularly the spring of 1990, uh, Paul Bernardo had not been identified. Now, clearly, there was a serial rapist operating in Scarborough uh, beginning in 1987. So when Liz went missing, it had only been three weeks um, since the Scarborough rapist's last attack, which was May 26th, 1990. And that was a very, very brutal attack, so much so that we found out later, I only found out during the course of uh, my second trial, or at least the pretrial arguments, that the, the victim had almost died. Uh, and in fact, um, her parents have been told that uh, there was a very good chance that she wasn't going to make it through. So, of course, against that backdrop, Liz went missing. Uh, a lot of people were talking about it, um, but the police certainly didn't consider it as a possibility. You know, they may have privately. Um, but then it just kind of went away. Um, and then so my trial began um, in... Uh, January of 1992. And it wasn't really until about halfway through my trial that uh, a woman who believed that a former boyfriend of hers uh, was actually the Scarborough rapist. Because again, I mean, we knew that the Scarborough rapist was out there and he was unapprehended, um, but we just didn't have a name and a face to put to the case. So she actually contacted my lawyers uh, and she said, I think that I know who the Scarborough Rapist is, and I think he might have known Elizabeth Bain. Um, so that was really the first time that the Scarborough Rapist as an alternate suspect really came up uh, in my case. Uh, and then, of course, you know, it didn't really develop that much. Uh, I was convicted, um, and it really never came up again until, uh, I think, February 1993. Now, by that time, I been convicted for almost a year and then suddenly out of nowhere he was arrested so basically from about like february 1993 um right up until uh, 2000 when i was released uh, a lot of the work we did on the case particularly uh, work done by a private investigator uh, that my original lawyers had hired but who, who stayed on the case was looking for evidence to connect then of course paul bernardo uh to the crime uh, he lived in Scarborough at the time. Um, he was known to frequent areas where young women uh, were likely to be. Um, he obviously went on to kill three women, two of whom he abducted. Uh, and there's always been speculation that Liz was abducted. Um, I would say up until maybe around 2013, 2014, I, I thought that Paul Bernardo was a very viable suspect. Uh, and Liz's disappearance. I think he actually still is. Um, but in my view, based on information that came to the attention of my civil lawyers in 2013, I think that likelihood is probably low now. Uh, so that's not like who I would think is a person responsible, but then, you know, it, it's hard to say. Certainly in terms of propensity um, and I guess track record and where he was living at the time. Yeah. It's shocking to me that the police never considered him a suspect in Liz's disappearance. Frankly, I think he should have been the suspect and it may very well be that they were afraid that he might have been the person responsible. But as of right now, I would say the likelihood, I would put that fairly low. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, now obviously, I mean, my, my appeal lawyers, uh, they felt that there was certainly evidence that suggests that he was the person responsible. Um, and that was something that we continued to develop, you know, right up until 2008, uh, when I was acquitted. Um, we never got a chance to see that evidence tested in court, and it would have been interesting uh, right. to see how that would have gone. Um, but again, it never really got to that point. So... 
So, I mean, you've mentioned that there was, there was a lot of pressure on you by the police to confess. And yes, very much so, yeah, very much A few so. minutes ago, you said you couldn't confess because you didn't know what happened to Liz. Correct. So I, I guess my question then is, given, given the pressure, you know, we know that, that many people uh, in your situation do make false confessions and, and sure. confess to crimes that they didn't commit. You, you did not. How did you sort of continue to be strong and pursue the truth? What, what advice would you give, I guess, also to other people in terms of, of those who are maintaining their innocence while they're in custody? You know, I think there are so many different variables, um, a lot of personality factors that go into it as well. I mean, some people um, can be moved. Uh, some people can be pressured. Um, you know, if, if you're looking at false confessions, uh, in a lot of cases, the pressure that the police put uh, on these individuals is so unbelievably strong. Um, they just kind of want to get out of the room, you yes. know, so they kind of feel like if I just tell them you know, what they want to hear, um, this can all just go away. I mean, it sounds somewhat crazy, but as someone who's kind of been in that situation where the police are kind of acting like you would be crazy not to think that you're guilty, um, you know, I, I know that that environment can be very oppressive. Um, that's the bad news. The good news for me is that I'm a pretty stubborn person and um, I don't like to... Uh, admit I'm wrong when I know I'm right. Right. Um, I, I've said to people in the past, I, I don't really know what would have happened if the circumstances had been the same, only they actually had found Liz, as opposed to not having found Liz. Um, because I mean, my position has always been, I can't A, confess to a crime I didn't commit, but B, I can't tell you what you need to know, which is where she is. Right. Of course, they would just say, oh, well, he's just stubborn. Right. Um, but I know that um, particularly that first night, um, the 24th of June, um, where I went in and originally I thought they just wanted to ask me like a series of very simple questions. And then like three hours later, I'm like, oh, my God, like these guys actually think I did it. Yes. Right? And then part of me was like starting to panic. And part of me was like, just calm down, like by the time this interview is over, they're going to realize that you didn't do it, right? You can convince them that you didn't do it by like appealing to their sense of rationality. And, and that just never happened. Um, that was really the only time like I, I might've been, you know, might've been tempted to say something like, uh, just to get me out of the room. But again, I mean, I mean, I just engaged them and say, like, tried to explain to them why, I, like, it couldn't have been me. And I just, uh, you know, it's, it's a really helpless feeling. Um, and I think maybe, maybe because I had a background in psychology, having, like, studied psychology, I kind of knew, okay, now's the time that you have to stay calm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but I know that I've met other people who through no fault of their own, if they were in that situation, they, they probably would have freaked out. So I, I, I guess I could just say I was lucky. It just the type of personality I had, I was the type of person who, who, who wasn't gonna budge. But I mean, who knows, as I say, if they had found Liz and they said, listen, we already found Liz, so just tell us you did it and this is all gonna be over with. I mean, heck, um, uh, like a year later, they were offering me a manslaughter plea. Right. Um, but I had to tell them where she was and, right. and I couldn't do it. So I said to my lawyers, I said, you know, I can't plead guilty because I don't know where she is. And they said, yeah, we know, but they asked you. And so, but um, I, I can certainly understand, understanding what it's like to be in that environment, in those conditions, why someone would actually falsely confess. And I know a lot of people who've never been in that position would probably say, you're crazy. I would never say I did it. I would pound my fists on the table. I would say, no, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I'm like, no, you don't actually know what you would do uh, until you're uh, in that position. So I'm yeah, not surprised yeah. that there are false confessions um, at all. Oh, I mean, and all the, the research shows just the intense, intense pressure in the interrogation room. And actually how much being innocent hurts and works against the innocent. Uh, because often the feeling is, I know, I know I'm innocent. So even if I confess to it now, 
you know, it's all going to come out once I'm out of the interrogation room. It's going to become obvious that I. I I, I think that that was the case in in uh, the Romeo Filion case. Yes. Where it yes. was just a silly false confession that he figured. You know what? They're going to figure out that I'm full of it, and it never it, it never happened. I think the other problem too is that um, many police officers, um, particularly homicide investigators, are trained to conduct an interrogation um, under the assumption that the suspect is already guilty. Absolutely. So the it's purpose, a guilt presumptive. Yeah, the, it's called the read technique. Yes. Right, where, and, and I remember I actually cracked open a copy of the read technique. I was just kind of interested in it for, for personal um, edification. Mm -hmm. And I laughed out loud at when I saw the chapter headings. Because it was kind of like, it was like, what to do when you know the suspect's guilty? What to do when you're pretty sure the suspect's guilty? Like it was almost like there was no possibility that the suspect that you were about to interrogate is actually innocent. And so if the interrogation is conducted in that way, it's kind of like there's only one possibility uh, in their minds, which is A, you're guilty, and B, you're going to confess. Um, I don't think that's going to be a very helpful interrogation if you've got an innocent suspect, but unfortunately they don't always look at it that way. And I think that's a major uh, flaw. Yes. Uh, in, well, in the read technique has been described as very good at eliciting confessions from the guilty. The problem is that it's also very, uh, very good at eliciting confessions from the innocent. And that's actually one of the things that really threw me off. Right. Um, I often wonder like how I would have viewed that interrogation if I hadn't just finished four years of university mm -hmm. where I was around people who were a lot more open-minded and a lot more reasonable and a lot more willing to change their mind if the evidence actually persuaded them that they should. Uh, and I remember just being struck by how impervious they were to any suggestion that they might have been wrong. Okay, and that's kind of one of the things that stayed with me all these years is just how futile um, I realized it was then for me to even try to talk them out of not being convinced I was guilty because they had pretty much already made up their minds. And so, uh, it, I mean, you could even say that it wasn't even interrogation as, well, as it was the early stages of my prosecution. Right. Like the thought that I might have actually been innocent is something that they had never even contemplated. And unfortunately, I think that that kind of stayed with the case, like from start yeah. to finish. Yeah, absolutely. Another example of tunnel vision where once they've set their sights on you, they're ignoring all other evidence and they're just, the, the goal yeah. then becomes to find the evidence that proves. Yeah, that yeah tunnel vision for sure. Like, um, and also tunnel vision married with confirmation bias. Right. You know, um, anything that isn't consistent with guilt, we're not interested. Or if we have to live with it, we'll see if we can twist it and make it at least marginally consistent with guilt. Uh, but anything that could be construed as evidence of guilt, I mean, we love that. You know, I mean, and, and I guess the sad thing is that like we all we all suffer from that. Um, but the difference is, is that confirmation bias isn't as much of a problem for people in the ordinary course of human affairs. Right. But when you're a homicide investigator and you're dealing with someone's liberty, you know, someone's life, I, um, I think you have a duty to try to be as, as broad minded. Now, I've been told that police officers are better trained now to be more aware of their cognitive biases. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not sure that even being completely aware of those biases um, is going to do away um, with phenomena like tunnel vision and confirmation bias. So, right. yeah. I'm going to shift gears a tiny bit and, and ask now about your, the process of your exoneration. Okay. So as you are very well aware, Innocence Canada is a nonprofit organization that's uh, dedicated to identifying and advocating on behalf of individuals uh, who have been convicted of a crime that they didn't commit. 
Uh, you mentioned that, that Innocence Canada was involved in your case. We have Wynn Ward joining us tonight from Innocence Canada. She's been described as, as the backbone of the organization. Can you just describe your, your um, involvement and your experience with Innocence Canada, uh, you know, how they worked with you to, to um, you know, help you prove that you didn't commit the crime of which you were convicted? Okay. Well, Wynn probably won't mind if I uh, give a little bit of a historical overview of Innocence Canada. I'll try to make it brief. Um, when I was wrongly convicted in 1992, there was another case that was um, going on uh, at the same time in London, Ontario. It was the Guy Paul Moran second trial. Um, and Innocence Canada really uh, grew out of the Guy Paul Moran uh, case. Um, Wynne became interested in Guy Paul Moran and the Guy Paul Moran saga, and she ultimately met with some lawyers and they kind of coalesced into a group. But at the time that I went to prison, wrongful convictions weren't really on the radar screen of a lot of people. Like they were, they were very much seen as anomalies, you know? And I think part of that was because this was still kind of in the pre DNA era where you didn't really have something that was bulletproof enough uh, for people to say definitively that someone had been wrongly convicted. Um, but by the time I'd been in prison for maybe two or three years, I knew that Innocence Canada had already taken up uh, the case of Guy Paul Moran and David Milgar. Uh, and in both cases, they were able to get DNA testing done and they were able to get those convictions uh, overturned and get those individuals exonerated. So I was actually um, incarcerated at Workworth Penitentiary um, in Campbellford, Ontario. And it just seemed to me that every few months, Innocence Canada was in the news, uh, getting somebody out of prison, somebody who had been wrongly convicted. And suddenly by 95, 96, this was an issue. And, you know, even, even prison guards were saying to me, wow, you know, like I didn't realize that innocent, innocent people could actually be wrongly convicted of murder, but now I realize it can happen because we now know, right? So I was just kind of watching um, from the outside in um, and I wasn't particularly happy with um, how I was being represented on my appeal. I mean, I was convicted in 1992. I thought maybe I might win my appeal by 1994 and 94 gave way to 95 and 96 and 97. And so I didn't know if Innocence Canada was aware of my case. Uh, I didn't know. Uh, I knew that they generally only represented people who had had their appeals exhausted. And I still had an appeal. It was taking an incredibly long time. Um, but finally, I just got to the point where I knew they were out there. I thought, you know what? I think this is a case they would be interested in. If they are, that's great. If they're not, well, I mean, I haven't lost anything. So I got in touch with them. And uh, it turns out they were aware of my case and they've been asking about it. Um, and they were kind of wondering what was taking so long. And so it was just kind of like a happy coincidence that they were aware of me and I was aware of them and the great work that they had done. And, and so I contacted them in uh, 1999 and I asked them if they would take on my appeal. And uh, James Lockyer uh, came to see me in person, which shocked me um, because he was like a star by then, right? I mean, he had kind of become um, the face of wrongful convictions in Canada and uh, he came to see me and he said, uh, we'd be glad to take your case. And I just remember going back to my cell that day and I was as ecstatic as anyone can be uh, when they're serving a life sentence for something they didn't do. But I felt like it was the first time in my life I had someone who, who really believed in me and who understood that innocent people go to prison. Um, and I, I'll never forget, he said, because there had been some talk because of the Bernardo connection and, and some evidence that might have connected him to the case that I might have actually gotten bail um, pending the hearing of my appeal, which is quite rare. Uh, and James said to me, he said, uh, he said, uh, he goes, uh, the good news is I'm, I, I'm taking, taking your case. He said, the bad news is he said, I think you can put any hopes of bail uh, away. I don't think it's, it's going to happen. It's not really real, real, realistic. So I said, okay, that's fine. And then he called me like three months later and he said, you remember when I told you that you weren't going to be able to get bail? I said, yeah. He goes, well, I think I was wrong. I think I can get you bail. And um, 
March 31st, 2000, I was out. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was an incredible uh, result and a uh, great organization. And uh, I was very fortunate uh, to kind of uh, be adopted uh, by their organization. And um, they've basically, they stayed, stayed with me right, right up until the day I was acquitted. Wynn was there in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. Of course, James and Joanne were there because they were my lawyers. And uh, I mean, they just continue to do stellar work. And I think, I think as Canadians, we should consider ourselves very fortunate uh, that we have organizations like that and, and that they've really put the issue of wrongful convictions on the map. Because most people in the ordinary course of affairs would never dream that they could be accused falsely of a serious crime because that's just not the way life is supposed to work it's not the way most people think our criminal justice system works but for Innocence Canada and, and people f who work for that organization they understand that uh, you know despite the fact that we have all these safeguards I mean uh, the worst can happen and uh, sometimes it does absolutely and I mean I can also add to what you already know that you know Innocence Canada works tirelessly to support the wrongly convicted win or, and I see Ryan Truscott has joined us, uh, make a habit of coming uh, to speak to students at the University of Guelph every year to, to say sort of just exactly what you've said that most people would never believe that one day they could be accused and convicted of something they didn't do. And, you know, we're very fortunate in Canada to have an organization like that because one, one day, you know, you just don't know if you might, them to, if you might need them to have your back and, and they're there when you do. And, and, and the other thing to point out, too, is because of their advocacy um, and because of the credibility of the organization and their track record, they've actually been an instrumental uh, in getting uh, the system to reform when it might not necessarily want to reform itself. Like sometimes you, you kind of have to hold people's feet to the fire uh, before they'll actually enact change. And I, I think that's another great thing that Innocence Canada has done is, is, you know, they have enough credibility that when they speak, you know, whether it's at the provincial level or the federal level, people listen, right? And, um, now I know that there are a lot of police colleges and criminal justice programs. They incorporate wrongful convictions into their curricula, you know, and, and I know that that wouldn't have existed 30 years ago. So yeah, we should be, uh, we should be very thankful for that. I just have one more. I mean, I have many, many more questions. I have one more question that I'm going to ask now before we sort of turn it over to uh, members of the audience to, to ask. Um, as you know, Maria Shepard is another Canadian exoneree, and she has been very vocal about the detrimental uh, consequences and impact of wrongful conviction. She has been quoted as, as saying um, that victims of wrongful conviction share one thing in common, and that is a psychological life sentence. To what extent, so this is really a question now that's asking about life after exoneration, mm -hmm. right? What, yeah. what, what does that statement mean to you? To what extent does that resonate for you in your life? Well, um, I think if you can make sense of it, uh, which obviously isn't an easy thing to do, um, it, it makes it a lot easier. Um, when I think of the fact that, you know, it's a life sentence, even when you get out, even when you're exonerated, uh, I just think about things like the loss of your reputation, um, the loss of your credibility, um, the effect it might have on forming new relationships with people, you know, who don't know a lot about the criminal justice system. Um, you know, when I was released in 2000, it was, it was, it was difficult for me for the first couple of months to adjust, but I was very fortunate. Uh, I was, uh, blessed to have a family that supported me and friends and, um, somewhat paradoxically, I never really felt like um, I ran into a lot of difficulty until after my case um, became very highly publicized. And then, and then suddenly um, the jobs stopped. Um, the job interviews stopped. Um, when you got the job interview, you kind of felt like the person like, was kind of evaluating you in a way that you know, wasn't necessarily consistent with just being an applicant for a job and that kind of thing. Um, I think it really varies. Um, I, I can understand why for some people, it's just they can't really comprehend how something 
so horrible could happen. Um, you know, for example, in a case like Bill Mullins Johnson, I mean, he was wrongly convicted of one of the worst and heinous crimes you could ever imagine. And it was a family member. And so he, he stood to lose his entire family. Um, so it, 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 I mean, it's definitely something that stays with you. And I don't think you can really outrun. Um, in Maria's case, obviously, she was um, accused of killing her own child, you know, which is, which is horrific. In my case, it was the woman I love. And um, so, yeah, I mean, they can get you out of prison, um, but I don't know if they can get the prison out of you. Uh, and for me, like, I don't think about it a lot, but I'm always reminded of it. Just little things like um, I went to a bank the other day just to like have a sit down conversation, right? And normally if you go to a bank, you just have a conversation with one person, right? But in this particular case, I sensed that the person at the bank knew who I was and she went and grabbed another person and brought her in the room and she kind of stood by the door, mm -hmm. like just kind of, and I thought, like, I kind of thought, oh, this is kind of interesting. Like, I wonder if she's afraid, she's afraid of me, right? So, so that's kind of like, for me, that's the most difficult part is always wondering, does the person know you? What do they know about you? What do they think about you? Do they really believe you're innocent? Do they think that you're lying? Um, or if they think that you're innocent, um, is he weird now because he's been in prison? And so um, there's so many different aspects of it. Um, I don't think you can ever get back to normal. Um, I think the, the best you can do is just try to minimize the effect it's had on you. But um, yeah, definitely um, the, the effects are, are long lasting and, and I wouldn't say that they ever uh, completely go away. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. I think well, now we'll turn it over. I, I mean, I have many more questions, but I think we should turn it over and uh, give other people an opportunity to ask their questions. Sure. Yeah. So I believe that uh, Professor Baker is going to start moderating that. Okay. Yeah, and we're going to start with a grad student who's going to ask us a question from our CCJP program. Uh, Sabrina, hopefully I've done this right. Hello. Hi, Sabrina. Hi, um, so my question was, um, recently wrongfully, wrongful convictions have been, become popular in mainstream media through movies and TV shows like uh, Just Mercy, Confession Tapes, and Making a Murderer. Um, my question is, what are your thoughts on the, main, on the media depiction of wrongful convictions? Do you think they're accurate or do you think more needs to be done? Um, well, I, I think that any attention um, that's given to them uh, is good. Um, I think, I think if I have any quarrel, it's sometimes they tend to focus more on individual failings as opposed to systemic issues. Now, I'm not the type of person who thinks that the system itself is completely, um, inept. Um, but, you know, I've said to people that I'd like to see less of an adversarial system and more of a system where the point is to get at the truth. I think sometimes what happens with the wrongful conviction movies in the series is they tend to focus on like a bad cop or a couple bad cops. And believe me, I know they exist. Um, but sometimes they don't talk as much about how, you know, it's important to have greater transparency. It's important to ensure that lawyers have all documents that are relevant to investigation. Um, that being said, I think they're great. Um, I, I, I have to admit, I try not to watch them because <laughs> they just really make me angry. Um, and they kind of put me in a bad mood, but uh, some, of them, some of them are pretty good. And um, I, think, I think it's almost like a new genre now. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Um, you know, the, I think if there's one drawback, it's just, I don't want people to think that like the whole system is corrupt, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not all corrupt. It just makes mistakes. Right. But I think that anything, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a made for TV movie, whether it's a Netflix series, anything that shines the light on wrongful convictions, I think is great. And, uh, the more, the better. 
I'm going to jump in with a question from our audience now. Um, somebody has asked, since being exonerated, have you received any reparations or compensation? And if so, how difficult was the process to get it? It's a very good question. Okay, so um, compensation is an interesting issue because if you go back to the early to mid 90s, when suddenly like everyone was shocked to find out that innocent people went to prison. Um, I actually thought the federal government and the provincial governments really stepped up uh, and started offering compensation. Um, I think the problem was, I don't think they realized how bad the problem was. And when they started to realize that, uh oh, I'm not sure if we can really afford like to start compensating everyone, they started to be a little more selective. Now, the first thing I should say is, is it's my understanding that there actually is no right to compensation in Canada, okay? Um, you can get it, they can make what's called an ex gratia payment. Um, some people have called it uh, shut up and go away money. I, I don't mean to sound cynical. Um, I would say right now, um, the, the issue of compensation, I don't think is, is where it needs to be. That's the bad news. Uh, the good news is uh, there are civil uh, avenues that are available now. Uh, and if I take that good news, I can also separate that into good news and bad news. Good news is the Supreme Court of Canada has affirmed that if you are exonerated, okay, and if you, for whatever reason, cannot persuade the government to compensate you, uh, you can sue. And they have affirmed the right of... Um, plaintiffs to sue the police for things like negligent investigation. Unfortunately, they have made it a lot more difficult to sue Crown prosecutors. And, and that's really unfortunate um, because I think you should be able to do both. Now, in my case, I was not given compensation. I was, uh, I, I was forced to go the civil route. Um, I can't actually talk a lot about that, unfortunately. All I can say is that that's over. And um, so, but, uh, but yes, um, I would say going forward, uh, it's going to be more and more difficult for wrongly convicted people to get compensated. That's the bad news. The good news is that there are provisions now for suing the police, uh, particularly in cases where their conduct is... Um, uh, meets the, the standard of negligence. Um, I personally, I don't think you should have to do that. Um, but for whatever reason, it just seems that they're uh, becoming less and less willing uh, to compensate and more and more tempted just to say, hey, if you want money, you can always sue. And I don't think that's necessarily fair, but unfortunately, that's where we are. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think, sorry, I'll just add to that. Now, there is this issue of factual innocence. What's factual innocence? Okay. So if, if you have a case where it can be proven with DNA, like let's go back to the David Melgard case. Not only did the D DNA exonerate him, it pointed conclusively at another suspect. And that suspect has now been convicted. Okay. Now, that would probably be what some people call the gold standard that would almost cry out for compensation. Um, but short of that, I, I think that unfortunately, it's become more difficult. So, and I don't like it. Okay, I'm going to jump in with the next question from the audience. So this question is, are you still angry or resentful towards anyone who was involved in the process of you being convicted or just angry in general? Oh, um, angry at uh, certain people. Um, I'm, I'm angry in particular at um, the two police officers who are in charge of the investigation. Um, mostly because I feel like they ignored very powerful exculpatory evidence. And um, in addition to being angry, I, I just, I, I'm just puzzled, you know, I'm puzzled because of course my lawyers found out in 2014 that um, four days after I was arrested, um, a police officer, one of the two lead detectives had a meeting at the Center for Forensic Sciences 
uh, during which he was told that uh, his theory of the crime, which would have had to be correct in order for me to be guilty, was a scientific impossibility. Uh, that evidence never made it to my lawyers. It never made it to my trial. It never made it to my appeal. And it almost never made it anywhere uh, were it not for the fact that one of my lawyers who was very diligent during the civil process actually found it, uh, found a note um, that was made uh, referencing that meeting. Um, so yeah, that's, um, I mean, yeah, there were a lot of witnesses at my trial who said things that weren't true. There were witnesses that were inaccurate. There were other witnesses who lied. Um, but I think ultimately, I think the ultimate responsibility goes uh, to the two police officers. And, and frankly, I think it goes to uh, the two prosecutors as well. I just don't think they were ever particularly interested in finding out what happened. Um, I think they were just interested in having a very troubling case uh, brought to a conclusion one way or the other. And uh, I mean, I, I don't allow myself to be consumed by anger, um, but I am somewhat disappointed that I feel like uh, the two uh, police officers weren't really held accountable. Um, you know, maybe I'm going out a little bit too far here, but I actually believe that uh, some of the conduct uh, that, that took place in my case uh, might have even um, been criminal. Um, but, you know, I mean, we're still hoping to ultimately get the case reopened, get it reinvestigated, uh, bring the right person to justice. And, and maybe that's the best way of actually dealing with that anger is just using it to motivate me. But, uh, you know, I'm not an angry person by nature. And I know a lot of people have said to me, gee, Rob, I mean, you, you don't really seem very angry. And I guess my response is that I, I try to kind of, you know, not be consumed by anger because I feel like then other people don't want to be around you. Uh, it can, it, you know, it can affect your psychological well-being. It can affect your physical well-being. Um, but yeah, I have my moments and uh, I still feel that um, uh, the Toronto Police Service uh, has a lot to answer to in this case. And, and that's one of the things I'm trying to uh, ensure happens. I have a, another question from the audience that actually lends itself nicely after the question about anger. Um, so kind of a two-parter. The one part is asking if this many years later, do you view what happened to you as a burden or trauma of sorts, or do you view it more as an opportunity to educate others? I'll start there and ask the follow-up in a sec. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've said to people that um, great wisdom sometimes comes with a price. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's given me a, a lot of um, perspective. Um, it's made me more forgiving. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of broadened my understanding of certain things. Um, you know, it's, when I was released in 2000, um, I kind of felt like I'd been given a new lease on life and, and I didn't, I didn't you know, I, I felt, I mean, there's no greater laboratory, like, to, to understand human nature than prison, okay? Because in some ways, it's a microcosm of society. So in that sense, I learned a lot. And I was actually willing to try and, like, let that go and just try to make it somewhat of a positive experience for me as much as I could. Um, but then for the next eight years, it was just a nightmare uh, to get anybody um, uh, to basically admit that they'd got it wrong. Um, so it's kind of been, it's kind of been up and down. Um, where I am right now is that I'm just happy it's over with. Uh, but I just feel like there's still a few loose ends. And one of them is like, obviously bringing Liz's killer to justice. Uh, but the other is just trying to get as many people as possible to understand that what happened was wrong. Um, but, but I know that, like I've kind of gone through stages where I spend way too much time thinking about it and it just kind of like brings me down. And that's when I say, okay, you know what? You just got to like take a break and just kind of like, you know, you know, you're out, the worst is over and you got the rest of your life. It's not easy, but I, I, I've, I've met other people who have been consumed by anger and bitterness. And I kind of said to myself, you know what? I kind of don't want to be like that because it's just going to make my life even worse than it would normally be. 
And the, the other part of that question from the same audience member was um, wondering about what you're doing today. And so you did talk about some of the challenges of, of getting a job and kind of the stigma associated with it. Um, but what are you doing today? Is educating people and working with wrongful conviction your, your main job? Or do you have a different role in your day-to-day -day life? Well, um, I was, uh, I mean, I was, I worked in the library uh, when I was in prison. Right. And uh, I know I liked it. So when I got out in 2000, I basically decided that I was going to become a librarian. So that's what I did. I went to Seneca College for a year. Then I worked for a year at the ROM. And then I went back. I did a master's degree at the University of Toronto in library sciences. And so basically I worked as a librarian up until 2010. Then it kind of became a little bit tough because, again, the case was getting a lot of publicity and you know, libraries were starting to close and the economy wasn't great. And so I kind of transitioned to teaching ESL. So I basically taught ESL uh, to private clients in Toronto from 2013 uh, to 2019. And I also work part time at the John Howard Society um, in Toronto. Um, I've never really thought about making uh, a career out of wrongful convictions. Uh, I make it a personal um, interests of mine to, to follow them, to follow issues. But one of the things I've been doing um, for the last little bit is actually um, going back and reviewing uh, every piece of evidence that was uh, found during the course of the investigation of Liz's disappearance uh, in the hope that we can uh, ultimately get the case reopened. Um, this COVID thing has kind of made things difficult because I should be in Toronto right now teaching ESL. Um, and that was my plan uh, for the beginning of May. Um, you know, I was staying with my brother a bit here because my, my civil suit was going on and uh, I thought there was a possibility there might be some movement in it. And so as of right now, um, I'm still kind of on the fence. Do I want to go back to Toronto and teach ESL when it looks like they might be getting ready to shut down again? Um, but um, that's, you know, I mean, basically librarianship and ESL up until 2019, 2019 to now, uh, I've just kind of like been shelved a bit, but um, you know, still, still reading voraciously, still going through transcripts and, and other um, motions and, and this, that, and the other. But uh, the good news is civil suit is finished. So now like I'm kind of ready to like get back into hopefully getting this case reopened. Um, so yeah, but always keeping my eye open for another library job or another ESL gig. So uh, a lot will depend on whether I go back to Toronto. I should have word on that within the next couple months, so. Thank you. Um, the next question asks, how was your prison experience? Were you scared and or nervous? Um, I was scared, um, especially the first couple weeks. Um, and it was also made more difficult by the fact that I was put in something called uh, level three administrative segregation. So basically I was locked up for 24 hours a day um, for months and months. I, I got the occasional visit, but it was very difficult. Um, I wasn't scared for my physical safety at first. I was just scared about like what was gonna happen. Um, then, of course, when I was convicted and I knew I was going to prison, I was a little bit nervous. But what I did is because I was um, in pretrial custody for about a year before I was granted bail, um, I just thought maybe I should pick the brains of anyone I knew who had also been like to the federal penitentiary just to know how I should act, what I should do, what I shouldn't do. Um, and, and so when the worst happened and I was convicted, um, I mean, for the first couple of weeks, yeah, it was really scary. I actually still remember like getting off the bus in Kingston and I was in leg irons and handcuffs and we're being marched into this, you know, basically looked like a, an empty factory. And then there was this whole huge holding bin. And I was, I just remember thinking to myself, my God, like what, what, what awaits me? But, um, I just try to pick up on, on prison culture as, as much as I could. And, you know, I got into a few disputes with people, but for the most part, I just try to keep my head down um, and just try to not involve myself in things like gambling or like, like drug use um, or, you know, anybody else's disputes, that type of thing. But, 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a scary place. And there were a couple times when I got involved in disputes and, and I, I feared for my safety. But um, I guess if I can be thankful for anything, it's the fact that um, I looked really young when I was first uh, convicted. And I think some of the people who were deciding where to send me, they kind of thought, okay, well, maybe we shouldn't send him here and here because these are rougher places. So the place I went, like, obviously it's prison and prison's prison, but um, you know, I, I didn't necessarily, like once I got used to it, I just kind of kept to myself. And, but uh, again, you know, uh, you always, always have to keep in the back of your mind. I mean, you could, you could end up getting in a physical confrontation and you have to be ready. So it's, it's not somewhere you can ever relax, but uh yeah, certainly I felt a lot better when I was granted bail. I felt a lot safer outside of prison uh, than inside. It's, 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 it, you know, there's some pretty scary characters in there. Um, some interesting characters, but some pretty scary ones too. Yeah. Another one of our students asks, um, with the lived experience of being wrongfully convicted, as well as your education, which you said played a role in your perception, did you experience moments where you questioned your own innocence? And then she's also wondering, um, do you, how do you think that this impacts those with a lack of education, a lack of resources, people of color, or any type of other disadvantage? How would your experience be different, do you think? Well, I think I, I said very early on that um, I was just immediately struck by how certain these two police officers were uh, that I was guilty. Right. I knew I wasn't, but in my mind, I thought, okay, there must be something or someone that has convinced them I'm guilty. And I knew I wasn't. So, so I guess I can say that I never really for a second doubted my innocence, but I guess there was like a very brief moment where, and it wasn't actually when I was being interrogated by the police. It was just kind of like, it was, I, I went out with a couple of my friends. We just went out to see a movie. It was like maybe about two months into the investigation and, and they were going around telling everybody, oh, we know Rob did it. We know Rob did it. And I just couldn't understand what was going on. And it was just so bizarre. And I remember I just turned to a friend of mine, like very close friend who ironically enough was thinking about becoming a police officer, but kind of got turned off at, and I just, I can't believe I said this, but I said to him, I said, you know, Neil, I said, this whole, this whole experience is so bizarre. I said, I, I'm starting to think, you know, like, is it possible I, I could have done this? And I just forgot. And he just kind of gave me this look like Rob, like, whoa, wake up. Right. Cause, cause I was like with, with him talking to him on the night it happened. So he knew. Right. But I said, okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it was like, as I said, I can understand why some people who might feel like they're being socially uh, or environmentally pressured into saying they did it, they might think like, maybe I just blacked out, maybe I just forgot. And the police will sometimes give that to you as an option, right? But I can honestly say like at no time during the course of my, my copious conversations with the police, which as, as I said, like, offline, my lawyers kind of wished I had been muted, um, that I ever felt like saying to them, okay, you know what, you're right. And it's just because I knew I didn't do it. I have to apologize. I kind of forget the second part of your question, but if you could repeat it. Yeah. Sure. Um, this was wondering about how uh, an individual with a lack of education or a person of color or a lack of resources may have had a, a more disadvantage uh, experience, if that's even possible? Well, I, I think that, um, I mean, at the end of the day, I felt for me, I don't think that um, I really had a lot of resources. Um, I think some people on the outside looking in might have thought that I came from a fairly well-to-do family. Uh, I didn't. Like, I, I had to have legal aid, that type of thing. Um, but I know that there were definitely moments uh, when I was going through what I went through and I thought to myself, okay, you know what? I came from a nice middle class family. I'd never been in trouble with the law before. I'm white. I went to university. I have a nice suit uh, and I'm getting screwed. <laughs> so, I mean, what chance would someone else had have if, for example, they were black 
they were poor, um, maybe they had a, a criminal record for something not particularly serious, but made them more of a target for the police. And that's when I realized like, whoa, like, I mean, uh, it, you know, like, like if what happened to me could happen to me, it's probably happened to others uh, and who are much more vulnerable uh, than I was. I, I would only say that in the end, um, maybe that might have worked against me too, only because some people might say, oh, well, he can't be a victim, you know, because he's privileged, right? Not that privilege was really like a, a, an issue as much uh, being talked about like in 1992. Um, but yeah, I, I can definitely see how others who are somewhat on the margins, uh, they'd be up against a lot more than I was, you know, um, you know, but hard to say. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I think I think one of the things that's remarkable about wrongful convictions, and you'll see this if you walk into the Innocence Canada um, boardroom, uh, when you see those unfortunate people whose pictures are on on the wall, is um, a lot of them come from interesting walks of life, and uh, not necessarily all poor, uh, uh, not necessarily all marginalized, marginalized. So I'm not going to go out and say it could happen to everyone because obviously it doesn't. But I mean, it, it, it can happen to someone uh, even, even if they think they, uh, they're uh, invulnerable, you know. Yeah. I think some people are more vulnerable than others, but I don't think that anyone is invulnerable. Yeah. Hi, Rob. Uh, oh, am I muted? No. Oh, hello. Hi. Uh, we've had a number of questions in the chat about how difficult it was to cope with losing someone you loved and to go through this or ordeal at the same time. And some related questions about uh, your relationship with Liz's family, both then and now, and th those relationships. Well, it's, it was such a unique case um, because when Liz went missing, we were all kind of just mystified as to what had happened. Um, because not only did she go missing, but we could we, we didn't know where her car was. So for the first couple of days, we weren't really necessarily thinking that she'd been murdered uh, or, or even that she'd taken her own life because there were some vague allusions to that in her diary that she was depressed and that she might have wanted to take her own life. Um, so our, our main concern, my main concern was really just finding her. All right. Um, you know, hopefully she had only like just decided to take off for a couple of days just to clear her head, whatever. She was under a lot of stress. Um, it really wasn't until the Friday when her car was found that it started to look like she might have been the victim of foul play. But it was just a car. And again, because we didn't know anything, the car is found, but Liz isn't in the car. Um, and then in the midst of all of that, I mean, when I'm just starting to kind of put my feelings together and to think about the possibility that she was gone, then suddenly the two police officers are telling me that I killed her, right? And unfortunately, um, from that moment forward, uh, whatever thoughts I had of mourning Liz were immediately transferred to protecting myself, right? And, and, and I've said this to many people, like one of the things that I'm still very bitter about is the fact that I never really got a chance to mourn Liz um, until like well after I was arrested. And in a certain sense, I, I feel like I, I never really have. And I think part of that is because she's never been found, but part of it is because out of necessity, I had to become somewhat selfish and I'm not proud to say that, but uh, you know, I think other people who have been in similar circumstances will tell you, uh, it's one thing to, to lose someone you love, but to then have the police turn around shortly thereafter and say, and you're the person who killed her, um, it, it almost makes it impossible to mourn. Um, so it's, it wasn't really until years later that I had the chance to do that, but then the immediacy was gone. And, and so, um, you know, it, it would, I, I think if you ask any family whose, whose loved one has gone missing, they kind of feel like they can't really fully mourn because there's still kind of that hope that they might still be out there. So, so I never really got that chance. And sorry, the second part? 
Yeah. Uh, about your relationship with the family, whether yeah. they accepted your wrongful. I mean, wrongful I, I had a, I had a decent relationship with Liz's family. Uh, I wouldn't say it was idyllic. Uh, her father was very protective, uh, and he was very strict. Uh, and I don't think he appreciated the fact that um, you know Liz kind of wanted to have a little bit more freedom. Uh, but you know, for the first week after she went missing, I mean, we were a unit. And we were looking for her and we were working together. Um, when I was first accused by the police, uh, I was so shocked that I didn't really know what to think. But in the back of my mind, I thought to myself, I, I wonder if someone in Liz's family might have pointed the, the finger in my direction. Um, I, I spoke to a lawyer the day after I was interrogated. And I told him, I, I said, I want to go back, like to spend time with Liz's family to sit down with them and talk to them. And he said, Rob, you can't do that. And, and I said, but I feel like I have to. He said, Rob, you can't, you know, I'm sorry, but your relationship with Liz's family is over, you know? And uh, I mean, it, it was advice that I, I'm, it was probably good advice, um, but unfortunately I never really got a chance to connect with them again. And, um, you know, I don't know looking back if the Bain family ever really truly believed I was guilty um, uh, but you know, they weren't necessarily complimentary of my relationship with Liz at the trial, which, which kind of made me a little bit, uh, bitter toward them. But at the same time, um, they never once said that I, I ever treated Liz anything other than well. Um, I think as of now, my understanding is they still are of the opinion that I'm the person responsible for Liz's death. Um, which is unfortunate. Um, it's, it's, I don't like it. Um, I wish I could change it. Um, because I think that if I could, uh, it might actually go a long way to possibly being able to work with them to try and find out what happened. But then at the same time, I mean, I don't know. All I can say is I don't really have a relationship with Liz's family and whatever relationship I had. Um, it was pretty much over from the moment uh, the police first accused me of her uh, murder. And, uh, you know, it hasn't really gotten any better since. So, so I'm going to try something now. Uh, we have a question from Ryan Truscott, and I'm going to ask oh. him uh, if he, if I can do this properly, we can get him on camera. I think we're good. Hey, good? Ryan, what's going on? Hey, Robert, how are you? It's good to see you. Last time I saw you, you were at the Soul Pepper Theater. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I think I have the, uh, I think I have one of the posters for that on the, uh, oops, right there. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There's, there's that good looking fella, your dad. Yeah. yeah. He's doing really well. Thank you. Good. Um, give, give, give him my best. I will. Absolutely. Uh, so my computer screen's just gone a little bit weird, but my question was, um, first of all, thank you for sharing your journey. I know that it's tough for people. Um, to constantly bring this up. I know it's one of the reasons that my dad just doesn't get out and speak anymore is that it just, you know, brings up a lot. Um, as the son of, as the son of Stephen Truscott, that, you know, is a very well-known case that he can call a press conference and people show up or ask for a lawyer and people are there. Um, you know, I often say that we were very lucky, um, even though unlucky. Um, what challenges do you think that those cases that are less well-known struggle with? And how can the general public help mm -hmm. them? So the people that are you know, that don't have big notoriety, how did they get help? Well, I, I think that um, the media can be somewhat selective. Um, like sometimes certain cases are, are considered more newsworthy than others. Right. Um, I, I've often wondered actually why my case generated as much publicity as it did. And I think part of it was because there was a certain narrative that was media, I guess, attractive to the media. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, you know, uh, turns out boy killed girl, that type of thing. Um, I think sometimes the problem with the media is they're more interested in telling a story than actually giving a voice to someone who's been wrongly convicted. I think the other problem too, unfortunately, is sometimes the media doesn't really ask questions until it's too late. You know, like, you know, you've been, you've been accused, you've been tried, you've been wrongly convicted. And then everyone just kind of assumes that justice was done. 
right? Sometimes it takes a little bit of, uh, of, of hard work. Like for example, Innocence Canada is great, right? Because even though you as an individual might not be able to summon the media uh, to your cause, they can bring attention to your cause. And sometimes they need to kind of be pushed and prodded to do that. Um, I th I'd like to see the media a little bit more pro proactive, you know? Um, you know, I'd like to see a little bit more investigative journalism in Canada, you know, where they're willing to go out and ask tough questions, even at the initial stages, say, of a trial, like, hmm, this evidence doesn't seem particularly strong. You know, maybe there's, there's, there's something that needs to be said here. Um, as far as, like, people who say are on the margins, um, I think, unfortunately, you know, once you're in prison, I think people are kind of afraid. Um, because they don't want to be, they don't want to be shown up, you know, they don't want to be proven to be wrong. Like there's, I think there's kind of a fear there. Um, we don't want to give this story a lot of attention until everybody else is pretty sure. Right. So it's, it's tough. I mean, sometimes I'll hear of a, a wrongful conviction. I'm like, oh, this is the first time I've heard of it. Right. And I think, why, why didn't we hear about this before? Um, so I think sometimes they just, they just are, are a little bit sleepy. And uh, I wish they'd be a, a little bit more attentive to some of the problems that exist within the criminal justice system. Because wrongful convictions aren't going away. Right. Um, so who knows? Maybe they need to uh, assign more reporters um to, to look look to look into these cases you know i mean not everybody has the good fortune say someone like um who was the fellow out on the east coast who was heir to the moose head fortune dennis oland you know like that was a great documentary right but for every dennis oland i mean there might be another 15 or 20 people who are never going to get their story told and unfortunately sometimes the only time we ever hear about them is when innocence canada does a lot of the legwork and then can kind of like sh sh hand it to the media and say, here you go. Right. I'd like to see a little bit more investigative journalism. So. And the, um, the sort of the second part, my favorite thing is going in and speaking in Carolyn's uh, class, just because I think that being able to just, you know, right before people are graduating and they're getting out and trying to make a difference in the world. Um, their biggest question to me is always, how do I help? What do I do? And what, what do you have to offer them? Like, what would you, what your answer be to that? Well, several. First of all, is they can volunteer for Innocence Canada. Um, they can become lawyers um, and, and, and become lawyers. You know, one of the most disappointing things I ever heard anyone say, and I won't say who said it because very, very nice person. Um, this person <laughs> who will remain unidentified, articled with James Locke here. Okay. And he knew all about wrongful convictions. Sorry, I said he. Okay, that's it. <laughs> anyway, this individual ended up going to work uh, in the Crown's office. And this person told me, he said, you know what, I can honestly say that nobody in that office even thought for a moment that anyone they were prosecuting was innocent or could be innocent. He goes, it just wasn't even a consideration. So for anyone who's planning on being a lawyer, always keep in mind that you could be wrong. Okay. If you're becoming a police officer, always keep in mind that you could be wrong. If you're just an ordinary citizen, you know, don't believe everything you hear on television or in the newspaper, right? Just be, be, be cautious and be skeptical. And if you're ever in a position to help someone who's wrongly convicted, try to do whatever you can. It doesn't have, you don't have to move heaven and earth but sometimes just a little bit of effort can go a long way. I mean, sometimes all it takes is finding that one piece of paper in a box that's sitting in the Innocence Canada office, and that can actually make the difference between somebody, say, you know, getting their innocence acknowledged and maybe spending, like, the, the rest of their life in prison. So, you know, we can all make a difference in different ways, um, but those are some of the ways we can do it. Awesome. Thanks again for sharing. No problem. Take care. Good seeing you Bye. again. Thank you. So the next question is also more about what we can do. Um, this question asks, what can judges do to mitigate wrongful convictions and what can other justice actors do to prevent such wrongs? Well, well they can be unlike my judge. Uh, 
you know, um, I, I think, I, I think they need to understand that as judges, the person who comes before them, okay, could very well be innocent. Um, now, most people would think that as a judge, that's your duty, like to be impartial. Uh, I think, unfortunately, human nature being what it is, um, judges sometimes prejudge certain cases. I feel like that happened in my case. That's the bad news. The good news is that the Court of Appeal agreed. Um, I think something else judges can do is ensure that um, adequate disclosure is made to the defense, okay? Um, that the prosecution doesn't take liberties. Uh, the prosecution doesn't stretch the evidence beyond that which it should go. Um, to not be too critical uh, of defense counsel, uh, particularly when they're not um, necessarily very experienced. Um, you know, I, I felt like I, I had good judges in uh, 2007 and 2008. Um, I was kind of disappointed at my appeal because I felt like at least one of the judges had already decided that um, I was not going to be acquitted on appeal uh, and, and, and that I was going to have my conviction quashed. I was going to get a new trial. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes judges are, are in tough because, you know, I don't want to say they live privileged lives, but I think sometimes you kind of have to understand um, what life is like for ordinary people. Um, you know, when you, when, when you have a defendant that comes before you. Um, that being said, um, I, I think judges probably get better uh, education now uh, because now we have a body of wrongful convictions. You know, I can tell you when I went to prison in 1992, I, this doesn't have to do with judges as much as prison guards. But if you told somebody who worked in prison that you were innocent, they'd laugh in your face. They'd think like, yeah, right, whatever, right? Um, but by like 1995, 1996, I started to sense that they, they understood, you know. So I think that judges are probably in a better place now to do that. But, you know, just to, to try and be as objective as possible, and understand that, that everyone who comes before you um, should truly be presumed innocent, um, you know, before any type of uh, sentence uh, is passed. Rob, our time together is quickly coming to an end. So I'm going to ask one last question from the audience. Um, wow, you, that was quick. I know, it's been an amazing hour and a half. Uh, if you could make sort of one or two recommendations to reform the criminal justice system, uh, you know, in, in an effort to reduce the number of wrongful convictions that happen in this country, what would those recommendations be? Well, I, I think I alluded to one earlier, but I'll, I'll just repeat what I said. And that is that um, there was really a moment during the course of my trial um, where I kind of felt like, do I even need to be here? You know, because I felt like it was... And, and not casting aspersions on lawyers at all, but I kind of felt like it was just a fight between two sides. And I wasn't really sure that the whole point was to get at the truth uh, as much as it was just to win a debate, you know, and, and that whoever won that debate didn't necessarily get the result that was consistent with what had actually happened. So that's a convoluted way of saying, I'd like the system to be a little bit more open and transparent and more oriented toward uh, getting at the truth, finding out what actually happened. Like I never forget, I overheard somebody say during my trial, you know what, this isn't a who done it, Rob. This is a, did you do it? And I thought, you know what, that's kind of sad because we're all kind of here because we want to find out what happened. So now I'm sure a lot of criminal lawyers in North America would not be happy to hear me say this because they believe in the adversarial system. Okay, they believe that you should just choose up two sides and have the two sides wage war with one another and whoever presents the better case, you know, that's the case that wins the day. 
I'd like to see more of, of kind of a participation between all sides to say, okay, let's look at all this evidence and see where it actually leads. Because that way you avoid uh, the, 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 I guess, the danger of, oh, we're going to give you this, but we're going to not give you that. Well, we're going to keep this because we think that you could actually use that for some purpose we don't want you to. I'd like to see it just a little bit more open, a little bit more egalitarian, a little bit more objective, and a little bit more oriented toward getting at the truth and finding out what happened, as opposed to just like having a fight and let's see who wins. Yeah. All right, thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. I want, to, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming tonight. We recognize that your story is not an easy one to share. You know, it's it's very, very, very difficult past. And we, we do really sincerely appreciate that you took the time to explain to us. As you know, the purpose of Wrongful Conviction Day is to educate people about wrongful convictions and just the incredible cost that they inflict um, on individuals, on families, on communities. Um, and so hearing your story and have you explain in your own words what your experience was like really helps shed light for, for the rest of us on sort of the causes and consequences of miscarriages of justice and gives us some ideas as to what we can do um, to help the cause and also to work um, as we have, have students moving on to be the next, you know, leaders in criminal justice, what they can be doing to help ensure that we have fewer wrongful convictions moving forward. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank this you is, for having me. Yeah. This is typically where you would hear a very loud and warm round of applause. <laughs> so we can just imagine that that's I happening right now. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Well, thank you for much, uh, so much for having me. And uh, wow, the time went fast. But, you know, I hope that uh, I was able to uh, you know, help contribute to the event. And thank you for the invitation. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Okay. All right. I also I also want to quickly uh, do a shout out. I'd like to thank the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences for supporting the event. Also, very importantly, I'd like to thank Wynne War from Innocence Canada, because without her, um, these sorts of events don't come together. So thank you very much, Wynne. And Thanks, also, Wynne. absolutely to our administrative assistant, uh, Lauren Van Veen, for all the effort and, and countless hours that she's put into making tonight possible. Okay. I also want to thank uh, the members of the audience for coming tonight and for your very uh, thoughtful, insightful questions on what is, you know, undoubtedly a very, very important topic. So thanks for your participation. We hope that you all stay safe and that you will be able to join us this time next year for Wrongful Conviction Day. Um, have a great night. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone. Nice to meet you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good Bye. night. Good night.